The following interview was, was conducted with O. Fred Rosal, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Physiology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, September 30th, 2009, Stewart Center, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Russell, and thank you very much. Yeah, Let's start you. off by, if you'll tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born in Oak Park, Illinois. Okay. February 4th, 1931. <clears throat> my father is, uh, my father's from uh, near Hamilton, Ohio, and his parents came from Germany and France. And my mother came from Chicago, Illinois. She used to tell us about the, the days back then when uh, Al Capone was running up and down the streets. She was there? Yeah, we lived in that neighborhood, unfortunately, or she did. And her parents came from England and Ireland, so I'm a, not, my family hadn't been in the United States very long. Uh, <clears throat> How did your parents meet? Your father well, I really don't know. Oh. He was a CPA in Chicago, and she was she taught worked with the Moody Foundation, teaching Bible school in sure. there. Sure, okay. But shortly after I was born, I was three years old. I had two older sisters, and we moved to a, an old farm near Dayton, Ohio, about halfway between Dayton, Ohio, and Hamilton, Ohio. And it was I mean, it was primitive. No indoor plumbing, and I mean, you were it was, roughing it. We were roughing it. Camping out. And we lived there for until I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about high school. How large and any activities you were involved in? Well, uh, I went to Lanier High School. It was uh, five miles south of West Alexandria, Ohio, and it was small. I started. It was a two-story building. I started on the bottom floor in the uh, southeast corner and worked my way up to the bottom floor, northeast corner, that was eighth grade. And then we moved upstairs and the seniors were along the window, the girl along the window, then the juniors, sophomore, and freshmen. You and all I, just stay in the same classroom all day? No, we home. went different classrooms, okay. but that was our home room. Okay, right, gotcha. And uh, there was only about 100 in the whole high school. So athletics, uh, I like football. We didn't have enough to field a team, so we didn't have football. I tried basketball and I was a little rough for that. I fouled out in five minutes and so I quit that. <laughs> and I wasn't fast enough for track, but I could run cross country. Sounds good, okay. <laughs> but I graduated in 1949. Okay. And then I, my father, my father had a uh, doctor of divinity from Yale and a bachelor's degree from Hiram College. So he was pushing us to go to college. I had two older sisters, a younger brother and a younger sister. You were Both, in the middle. I was in the middle. Both the older sisters went to Hiram and graduated. I went to Hiram right after graduation and I just barely got through medieval history in the summer course and I tried to go that fall. I, w I wanted to play football. And I was taking a math course, and math is my strongest field. And I was flunking out, so I quit. And I'd, I went back to farming, and I drove a milk route, picking up the 10-gallon cans, and that got to be a lot of work, so I went back to college. I had a wrestling scholarship to University of Wisconsin, Oh, now that's the sport you took up wrestling, huh? Well, I, in, okay. when I was in high school, uh, a couple friends and I used to go up to YMCA and we'd wrestle at the YMCA. We'd wrestle with the local professionals. And, uh, but when I was at Wisconsin, it turned out that with my scholarship there, it was still more expensive than going to Ohio State as an in-state student, so I went to Ohio State. How'd you like it at Wisconsin? Wisconsin was, it like was nice. Uh -huh. It was a nice campus. And they have that nice lake there, right on the campus. Yes. Yeah, yes. Madison, right. right behind the, uh, I think they called it the Union. Yeah. Real nice. 
I can't remember who was the big football player back then. That had been in the 50s. Sure. But then I, my college experience had been rather varied. Because when I came back from Wisconsin, I started working. I was going to go to Ohio State in the fall, but I got tired of working, so I went to the University of Miami and took a course. Okay. <laughs> and then I went. We're checking out all the sites, right? <laughs> Miami is nice too. I was sure. familiar with Miami because we ran a cross country and track at Miami. But then I, after that, I went that fall. I went to Ohio State. And why'd, why'd you go to, was that for the, were you pre-vet at that time? Yeah, I was pre-vet. Oh, you had decided you wanted to go to be a veterinarian. Yeah, I was pre-vet. Okay. And so I went to Ohio State, and uh, my money was running out. Well, before that, I should, I'm getting this all mixed up. Before that, I was going to get drafted, so I joined the Air Force. Well, I was only in the Air Force about six months or so, and my father got leukemia, and I was granted a hardship discharge, so I went back driving the milk truck again and farming. But after my father passed away, I decided that was too much work, so that's when I went back to school. I went to uh, University of Wisconsin, then Miami, then Ohio State, and then my money was running out, so I had an opportunity to go in as an aviation cadet. So I went into the Air Force again. But I have an eye problem. It's called exophoria. My eyes deviate out when they get very tired and you lose depth perception. That's not good for a pilot. Mm -hmm. So if you go into aviation cadets and wash out, then you can get out in two years. So I got out in two years. But while I was in the Air Force at, uh, middle, uh, at uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, the Air Force. Where they do the Saturn today. So yes, yes. There was Stewart Air Force, Seward Air Force Base there. But they were pushing education. So I went, to, I took three quarters of chemistry at Middle Tennessee State while I was down there in one summer. I took a bunch of them. And then when I. Utilizing your availability and the yes. resources. And then they shipped me from Seward, they shipped me to Larson in Washington State. Well, Again, they had too many people in the Air Force, so if you wanted to go to college, they'd let you out three months early. So I went out, I got out three months early, I think it's December of 55, and I went back to Ohio State, finished my pre-vet, and started vet school in 56, okay. the fall of 56. Let me interrupt for a minute. Was the pre-vet approximately two years? Was that uh, how it worked? Pre now, was the pre-vet in, also in the vet school? or No, pre-vet is, is just a, a curriculum of subjects that you have to take, and they don't care where I didn't lose any credits because I kept my grades up every place I sure. went, so everything transferred. You had to have things like English and speech and mathematics and all that, and so I The got general... General yeah, course. general curriculum, but with certain subjects that pre-vet wanted. The pre-vet back then at Ohio State was a minimum of two years and anything after that. Well, when I was in pre-vet, that's where I met my wife. She was a secretary to my advisor. And so I think we got, I started in vet school in the uh, fall of 56 and we got married December 19th of 1956. Okay. Okay. And so I went through vet school there. While you were married. Did you work at all while you were in the vet school? Well, I had a couple of jobs. One was uh, I worked as a sort of a, early on I worked as sort of a waiter or cleanup boy at Tomain Tommy's. It was a little fast food joint or a little joint. It was I right love that name. Right across from the Union. And it was a uh, it probably wasn't uh, as big 20 as feet wide and about 60 feet long. and Like a railroad car or these old diners yes. they used to have. But then later on, I got a job. One of my classmates got a job as a, a student, as a watchman in the student dorm, a, a female student dorm. And so through him, I got a job as the night watchman at the student nurse's dorm. And my job was to 
there were two of us had the job. We'd either work half a night or we'd work every other night. Go in at, uh, I think we went in about 10 or 11, and we'd stay till 7 in the morning. And our job was to lock up the doors and make rounds periodic to see that nothing was wrong. And then the student nurses were on call from the hospital, which was about as far from here to the vet school. And if they got a call, we got a call from the hospital, we'd go wake, give a call to the nurse, student nurse, she'd go wake up and come down, then we'd escort her over, and then when she finished, we'd escort her back. Now the reason they start doing that is because one of the students got attacked one night, and so they start providing escorts with her. And I got the tremendous wage of a dollar five an hour. But I had that job all the way through vet school, and it, it was still, still in the nursing residence hall. Yes. Okay. Good. And the nice thing about it was that I could do all my studying there, and all I had to be is awake and pay attention to what's going on. Sure. Right. What was the size of your class? Was it a very large class? Were there any? Was there any? At, all in the male? vet school. Were there any women in the class? Not, not in my class. There okay. was, I think, a woman ahead of us, and some start afterwards. The same way at Purdue when I got here, they had very few women. Now it's, I hear over seventy percent. That's, that's what I'm hearing from people. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So. And was your wife working while you were in the vet school too? Yeah, she was uh, head secretary of the Department of Animal Science. Okay. And what was nice about that is uh, we had a car, and she had an A sticker, parking permit. So I would take her to work, and then I would drive over to the vet school and park. Because you had a permit. Because I had a permit. <laughs> and it made it nice. <laughs> yeah. So, what, uh, then after you got your, your vet school vet degree, what came next? Well, I, uh, I'm kind of a professional student. I like to study. Even when I was in high school, I liked to study. Sure. And so I got You never lose <coughs> your, love, your life for learning, and there's always more to learn. So I uh, applied for different fellowships or uh, positions, and I, I applied at Ohio State, University of Illinois, and Purdue, and a couple others, and uh, Purdue's came in first. What was, uh, in those days when you were in the, was there much financial assistance for students in the vet school at those, in those days? Well, I don't know, because okay. I never, my wife was working, and see, I was a GI. So in, you, in fact, you, so you knew you could use the GI Bill? Yeah, I used the GI Bill. Okay, in I was going to ask you about that. Fifty percent of my class were GIs, okay. ex-GIs. Okay. And what was funny about the GI Bill, funny, interesting, is that our last year, I went in financial aid and applied for a loan of $1,000 to get through, and they wanted to know, well, you haven't had any requests so far, why do you need $1,000 now? And I said, well, my GI Bill just ran out and we had our second child. He said, I think that's good enough reason. <laughs> approved. <laughs> so they approved, I, I, so when I graduated, I had a $1,000 loan debt. <laughs> not too bad, yeah, not today's times. No. Yeah, but gas was 21 cents a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes a difference. That's right. But I came to Purdue as a graduate student. Okay. Uh, actually, called a graduate instructor. I got paid a, whole, a great amount of five thousand a year. But I got my but tuition and stuff. But you have to remember in, in those times what it was. Yeah. But I and I also got my tuition in that. So. All right. What was the campus like, and where did you live when you came here? Actually, when we the campus and you had was. two children by the, that time. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. The campus was. Uh, much more open. I mean, you drive all over sure. on it. And, and the school was very relatively new because it opened in 59. You came in 60, right? Well, the school wasn't finished. Oh, okay. But first where we lived, uh, on Yeager Road, we lived north on Yeager Road, and the drive, old drive-in, if you remember that, was outdoor, outdoor drive-in theater, was right across the road from our house. I've heard about, I came in 68, and I don't think that was probably there at that time, because uh, I lived in Beauchard in apartments, and I don't recall when we were seeing the drive-in that particular, but I may have been mistaken. 
Well, when you head out north, yeah. and I don't remember the road now. Okay. So what, it's the main a rain road going out, goes by Smitty's, and sure. where you turn off on Jaeger. We were just after you turn off, and the okay. drive-in was on the other side. Okay, okay. Now I forgot what else I, you asked. That's all right, that's all right. okay. Then what, what was your initial, when you got, you, after you finished, so you came as a grad student. I now, came as a grad, graduate you, instructor. So you could do some teaching. Yeah. Well, I was, my main, uh, job was uh, the labs, physiology labs that we gave, and any other stuff they wanted me to do. But the funny thing is, uh, the school wasn't finished when I came. So there was still, con was still construction? Well, they were finishing construction okay. and there wasn't any equipment. And uh, we oh, had that a, should have been interesting. We had a graduate student working in our department. He's from pharmacology, the School of Pharmacy, I should say. Nick. Uh, Rodney Nickander, now he's with Eli Lilly now, I think he's had to retire. But for the first summer, he thought I was one of the janitors. Because every time he saw me, I was driving a truck, hauling furniture and stuff, and moving it, in, moving it into the different labs and stuff. So it, it, we got there right at the beginning. I have a friend, and, and a similar comment I would refer to on that. Um, he is in Grissom Hall, and he said, I have the second floor of Grissom Hall, and sometimes people think he's the janitor on the floor, and not Dean. It's interesting how terms can come around and be misunderstood. Oh. <laughs> but then, go ahead, and go so ahead. You, fin you finished it after the master's, did you went out for the PhD? Well, I, I did a master's, I probably finished that in 63 or something. I was a slow student. I you were teaching also and getting moving equipment around. Well, I audited a lot of courses. I That's mean, okay. I audited courses that people want to write. I took electromagnetic theory and, Things and you know physical chemistry and statistics and. That's not all bad. I, in fact, when I was taking electromagnetic theory, my department head, why in the world are you taking that course? And you know, it it. To me, physiology is physics applied to the living animal. And that's my area of interest is in the physical sciences. Stuff you just have to memorize, I can't handle. If you can reason it out, I can do all right. And you feel more comfortable doing it that way. Well, anyway, after I took electromagnetic theory, the whole concept of the electrocardiogram Came a lot clearer to me as to why the waves were the shape they were and, and how different diseases altered the waveform and so forth. Right. And you're using that equipment in the school. You're using that type of equipment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> so Lynn Hall was built, and then they still had the other older building that was the original one that yes. was next door. Okay. Yes. Okay. In fact, the first year of vet students, uh, they had their physiology in the attic of the old building because the new building hadn't been completed yet. Must have been great in the hot summer or in the, in the warm weather. And there wasn't any air conditioning. And in fact, uh, <laughs> uh, the labs initially weren't air conditioned even in the new building, just the offices. <laughs> we know where our priorities are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Open the window. <laughs> I think it was five, six years later before they air conditioned <laughs> the labs. But you know, it's interesting because I was born and raised in Ohio and their temperatures are similar. We, are, we never had air conditioning, and we had a lot of summers, it was pretty hot, and we just lived with the screens in the windows, it seemed to yeah. be okay. <laughs> uh, well, we don't have any choice. That's right, exactly. Well, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your experiences in the vet school, and also you're going to, uh, I was going to ask about that Vegas authoring system, tell us about your research and teaching. Well, the main thing that I I noticed in the vet school, in our department, Department of Veterinary <laughs> Physiology and Pharmacology, Okay was that initially we started out with a lot of live animal labs to demonstrate. The students would do different things on them to demonstrate uh, how different bodies, organs work and so forth. And as time went on, uh, well, back then, dogs were $5 a piece. I mean, 
Where, where would be? Where would you get those? Could you get them from the Humane Society? Or no, we couldn't buy them from the local. Oh, okay. We had to get them from other places because the people that contributed to the local wouldn't do it if they sold us dogs. But yet they put down hundreds of dogs every year and got nothing out of it. We try to be as humane as possible with the dogs and anesthetize them properly and so there was no suffering involved. These were dogs that were going to be euthanized anyway. But as the time went on, and especially as we got more and more women in the class, they started objecting to these labs. They didn't want to hurt me, the Were you using smaller animals? Weren't you doing work with rats and mice as well? We did very little with rats and mice. Okay. Our main, no, I should rephrase it. I did very little with rats and mice. One of my colleagues, his student lab teaching was mainly with rats. It depended on what they work and what. It depended on. Uh, my area was more cardiology, okay. renal, respiratory, so you need a which animal. you need a larger animal. Sure. Okay. His area was reproduction and so forth, and so he could use rats to give them different hormones and show the effects. But eventually, before I retired in '98, we had completely dropped all live animal labs. Okay. Do you, did you use cats as well? Very few. Okay. Almost dogs none. Dogs and turtles and frogs. And it, I don't know whether you put this on tape or not, but they, the way they killed a turtle was you pull its head out and hit it with a hammer. Now, people say that's cruel, but if, if you destroy the, the brain, there's, there's no pain or anything. The, so you're doing it properly, and that's the key. That was the recommended way. All right. I remember one story about that. We had one guy that he, uh, he's a big fella. He was on the Purdue football team for a while, I think. His name was Griffith. But anyway, he had the head out and they were tapping it like that. And I said, that's, that's cruel. If you got, you got to hit it hard. So he gets the hammer, guy pulls the head out and hits and he misses. And we had these soapstone tables tabletops and he knocked a chip out of the tabletop. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> and he happened to flunk out, but that wasn't the reason. And then later on, uh, other students were working at that area and I showed them and I said, that guy missed, That's he flunked out. <laughs> Use that as your, as your yeah, guide. <laughs> that's your guide. Oh. Uh, did you want to make any comment on that uh, authoring system that you did? Well, the see when we dropped labs or e around that time, we needed something. Oh, what, approximately would it be in the seventies, maybe? Eighties, maybe. Yeah, it could be about okay. this. Just approximately. Sure. It okay. may have been later than that. Okay. But we were trying to put something in its place, and so computers were just starting coming in and so forth. And uh, so I was trying to write a, a program, a computer program that a non-computer person could enter data into and then it could be used to run a simulation, a clinical case simulation. And it started out slow and it got bigger and bigger and I just called it a program and somebody said, well, you got to have a name for it and it should be something related to what it is. And I got to thinking, I was teaching the neuro part of the physiology and we were over the autonomic nervous system and the vagus nerve is a nerve that it starts high up in the neck and is distributed to almost every organ in the body in the abdominal area. So, and it does lots of things, controls heart rate, partially digestive system, urination, all that. I figured, well, this program does a lot of things, covers a lot of stuff. That's what the vagus nerves does. And vagus in Latin means wanderer. So I just, that's what I'll call it. Good, good call, good choice, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, it was used quite a bit up until the time that uh, Windows went to strictly Windows and not, would not support DOS anymore. Sure, that's right. Um, tell us a little about how computers sort of gradually came into the school as well as into the university. Uh, you mentioned earlier before we started 
the records, medical records, or something else that worked out? Was yeah, good. early on in the vet school, we kept medical records and uh, you call them punch cards. And the uh, data was put on punch cards and then if they want to find out which animals had a certain disease, they'd run a pin through the proper hole and shake out all the other cards and then look at the ones left. And uh, computers were coming in then and I'd been using them for almost all the time I was here. I started in 1960. I'd used the main CDC computers for statistical analysis and stuff. So I was asked to see if we could put these on mag tape. And, uh, so I looked into it and I wrote up a recommendation. They decided that'd be a good idea. So I, I wrote a program that would then sort those records. Now, I don't think I wrote it from scratch, but I, I used one of the Fortran programs they had available that I could modify slightly and they would do what we wanted. What you need, yeah. But there was quite a bit of resistance. And there was resistance in even using the micros when they came in, the microcomputers. I remember going to our dean's office once and the secretary was using one of these $5,000 electric mag typewriters that you put on a card. You probably use those. And I asked her, I said, why don't you use a computer and do that? Well, we don't do that much. Well, now everybody in school's got computers. And one of our lab technicians in, in one of my colleagues' research labs they had computers in there to keep some data, and they they had floppy drives on them. Right? I asked them, I said, why don't you put hard drives on there? Well, we don't need that. Well, before they ended, they had two or three computers in there with multiple hard drives and everything else. <laughs> oh, dear. <clears throat> now, let's talk about uh, a little bit about the schoolhouse change in the, the different 60s and 70s started to grow, or what were some of the changes? Of course, Morse was the dean when you came, and then Stockton came in afterwards. Is that correct? Jack Stockton yes. was the next dean. And also for the research, the school was known as the School of Veterinary Science and Medicine, but then it changed in 74 to the School of Veterinary Medicine. The School of Science Medicine, if I say that right. Vet, no, it's Veterinary Science. <laughs> veterinary Science, science and Medicine. Right. That's, a, that's a holdover from the days it was part of the Ag School, I think. Okay. And I really don't remember too much about that. I I was not closely related to the deans okay. because but you knew they were. They, you were. Poor, I mean, the, the administration changed uh, from I, Morris to Stockton. Yeah, I th I think I was on one of the committees involved in that. But I'm not a committee person. I do it if I have to, but otherwise I stay away from it. Did you serve on any committees in the school? Would you, were you on the Senate at any time? You no, no, no. I, I was school. able to avoid that. I was on curriculum committee. And I That's an important committee. Yeah. Oh, I don't work. Yeah. There, I, curriculum committee is the only one. That, I was on faculty committee. I was chairman of that one. I think I was chairman of that when, when uh, Stockton became dean. Oh, okay. Well, the search sure. committee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I, again, I'm I'm not much of a committee person. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Um, then the the uh, the facilities. Let's talk about the facilities. How they've changed over time since you've been here. Well, it's it's just been. Uh, in my memory, I would just say that it's kind of like a, a creeping mine. They started with the original Lynn Hall and the Path Building, which is the older building and the other PATH labs. And then as I came here in 1960, and as it went along, it was just kind of a gradual growth. They increased things, they modified, like radiology, they started with one little area, and then they increased that a little bit. And then whenever they had main major building projects, they would make big jumps, but even in between the major building projects, there was always gradual movement toward a more uh, sophisticated operation, bigger operation. Right. But I, other than that, I couldn't yeah. really Let say. Let me ask you this. When you, in the early days, in the teaching hospital, but did they take clients, could the community 
uh, avail themselves like you can now? Because I used to bring my cats oh, yeah. there. You could always do that. Yeah, okay. it, they charge you. Yeah, oh yeah, I understand that, right. But I just didn't know in the early days whether or not, uh, except if you were with the university, uh, you could bring your animal there for some treatment. Well, they've changed that too, because in the early days, uh, earlier days, not real early, we could do some of the surgery ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm a licensed, I was licensed DVM, okay. and I'd bring my neighbor's dog into the lab and on a Sunday afternoon and spay it for it. Sure, okay. Or okay. bring my dog in and spay it. And right. then later on they clamped down on that or they said that wasn't appropriate. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> for a while, the small animal clinic, uh, the staff, if you had a dog that needed spaying or something like that, and actually uh, one of the surgeons told me, I said, I'm, I'm gonna bring my dog in to spay. And he said, well, don't bring it in now, just hang on to it, because one of these days in the near future we'll need something for the students to do and we'll give you a call and bring it in. So that's yeah, what I did. For sure, why not? That's good. They, um, they but get you can't do that now. They take other small animals too, I mean like birds and things. Well, they sometimes. take lots of things, Yeah, yes. right. Um, and, it, and the hospital facility has grown too. Oh, it's time. tremendously, yeah, yes. Yeah, that's right. And yes. now they, you know, so the whole complex, as we would say, has really grown over time and expanded. Yes. Yeah, are they still using that Beth Path building, the older one? Oh, yes. Are that's they still, still use that? Okay. And, uh, yeah, there's still offices in there as far as I know. Um, is that where, would that have been where what was known as the veterinary science? Would they have been meeting in there in that vet path building when, before the vet school? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, okay. Yes. I was in there, I've been in there a couple of times. It's interesting to find your way around. It's probably better now. <laughs> oh, how about the library? You talk, and make any comments on the library? You know, Ann Kirker. Well, it started out pretty small. And uh, it's gotten she bigger, was the bigger, first bigger. She was yes. the first librarian for the school. And for that school, yes. Yeah, for the yes. vet school. Right? Yeah, she was there for quite a while. That's right, exactly. But the, what was the library is now off, all office spaces. It's because they, when they built onto it, the library moved over there. I don't remember the year they built onto it. I think it was about 90 or something like something that. Something like that. I remember helping out shifting the books. I went over there and volunteered, you know, <laughs> the yeah. chain group or whatever. <laughs> now the, the library is tremendous. Yeah. And they, they've got a couple computer labs in the library. I was one of the ones pushing for the computer labs. There are kind of people. <laughs> uh, quick question. The Indiana School of Medicine has is in Lafayette, has a campus here. And uh, was there any time that you did any teaching there in, in for that school? Well, a few that years. campus here. A few years before I retired, I, I taught a few parts of the pharmacology lab, uh, particularly renal diuretics, I think. And uh, I don't know whether we called it statistics or not. It was sure. just an introduction to statistics. Okay. And for the researchers, it's the, the school of Ed in Indianapolis, but they can take their first two years, too, here as well as at other uh, South Bend and Terre Haute. There's other locations, yeah. too. Interesting. My uh, ophthalmologist spent his first two years here. What a small world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I didn't teach him that. That was before I was involved. In yeah, that. okay. Any special, any comment on your, was there any specific area of research that you were involved in? Uh, care to make a comment? Actually, uh, in addition to the computer, helped you a little bit. Well, I, I had to do research for my graduate degrees, and I, that was basically uh, related to uh, destroying the pituitary gland in pigs. And I used uh, strontium 90. I designed a stereotactic instrument that would allow me to put the needle into the pituitary gland and then the strontium 90 knocked it out and then followed, of course. Okay. But it, after my PhD degree, most of my research was, uh, I really was kind of a misfit because I didn't like cutting on animals. <laughs> so I, a lot of my research was in cooperation with other people and uh, my main area was in statistical analysis of the data. Most of the people like to collect the data. They didn't like to analyze it. Yeah, you're a good colleague to have on that part of the team. So I worked with uh, 
Uh, he, I can't think of his name over in statistics. Can't, I, names slip me, but I worked with him for years. And if I couldn't handle it, I'd go talk to him and he'd straighten he me out. He can manipulate the numbers. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> I can't remember his name. Yeah, that's okay. It'll come to you. Um, any awards and honors that you uh, want, um, any teaching or anything that came across your desk? Well. Did you like to comment on? My, <laughs> I don't know if my teaching was worth commenting on. I was a pretty hard teacher. I, you know, in pre-vet, mm -hmm. we require a year of math, including introductory calculus, and a year of physics. And students would come in and they'd expect that they should never see that again. And the areas I taught were, you know, blood flow is fluid mechanics, respiration is fluid mechanics, and I'd ask them to learn that, and a lot of them didn't like it. I kind of polarized the class. The good students thought I was doing a great job, the, bad, the poorer students thought I was the worst student, worst instructor they ever ran across. The only awards that I really got were I uh, put together a couple of, with the help of our uh, illustration department in the vet school. Al Allen. Al Allen and uh, David, 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 David. Andy and those. <coughs> we, I put together a couple of case histories that were interactive. You know, it, uh, <coughs> I wrote a computer program with the help of a grad student that would control the, the old Betamax players and had the information on the video on there and it, it would go through the case and it would present the history or present the presenting stuff and then you could pause and answer some questions and move on and uh, I did that two different times and both times it, it won the uh, first place at the uh, student AVMA in uh, New York. So yeah. I've got two awards for that. That's, That's nice. about all, yeah. yeah. We used to uh, active in the uh, Indiana Veterinary Medical Association as well as the national one. Do you attend any of those meetings? No. I was the annual one is always held at Purdue, isn't it? Indiana that usually meets here. The an the Indiana. No, mm -hmm. I, w I wasn't a practitioner in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I was basic science. Okay, that sounds good. I spent one summer in small animal clinic. Uh, this is because the neurologist was on vacation that summer, and since I knew neurology, that's my assignment for the summer. That right? was my assignment yeah. for the summer. Yeah. Let's talk about family. You, you, you mentioned earlier you met your wife when you were at Ohio State. Do you have any children as well? Well, I've got three did boys. You? Okay. Did any? Of them, did they come to Purdue? Go to Purdue? Uh, the oldest one got a degree in mechanical engineering. He's now at Charlotte, North Carolina. He's a assembly line engineer for Carrier, the air conditioning company. Uh, second son, he uh, joined the Marines after graduating from high school. Both of those were honor students at McCutcheon. And he had an accident in the Marines. He just made sergeant the week before and had an accident. And he was in a coma five months. And he was finally uh, given a medical discharge. Was he in an automobile accident? He's in a motorcycle accident. I'm not very fond of motorcycles. Another good friend of mine who was a student at, in the vet school, he graduated, he was in California, and he died in a motorcycle accident within, within the first year of graduating. Anyway, he's, he lives in Cheyenne, and uh, he's on Social Security and retirement from Marines, and he just does what he wants to or what he can. And, is he pretty able to get Oh yeah, he there? drives, and, but he, he's disabled to the point where he can't really hold a job. He can, but he can physically, but he can't, men can't mentally because he'll like forget to go in one day, and yeah. they don't like that. Yeah, that's hard. Okay. The youngest son, he works for SIA. He's the- uh, Here in town? Yeah. He's okay. uh, in charge of materials. He's- he, gets the materials into the plant and gets the waste stuff out of the plant and 
he says he operates about a two hundred million dollar budget. But he done he's got two associate degrees from Purdue. Okay. In from Kanoe building uh, is that computer graphics. Oh sure. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And now about how about your post I used to ask people their post Purdue activities. What sort of things are you involved in? Well, I'm probably a very boring person because I don't I kind of, so I was raised on a farm. Okay, good. Well, I never got off the farm really. I've got about 10 acres with about half of it in woods. And I mow and I, I cut wood and I repair the house and I bowl a lot. And uh, I work at the church. Our church has got a six and a half acre lawn I mow it. I've got a big commercial motor, five foot, twenty eight horse. It, it needs a little work, then, right? You got it. That's why you can use it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But I just, I, I'm into studying different things. I've, I've been studying the history. I haven't been studying the Bible, but I study the history of the Bible, the history of the religion, other religions, history of language, the history of mathematics. Now the way I study them is I buy DVDs that have lectures on them. That's great. Right. I sit well, around and listen to them. That's and okay. Prehistoric stuff. Very good. I like the Discovery Channel. I pick up and history has some good things on too on the TV. Oftentimes, so, you know, it's kind of thing. And is your uh, is your wife uh, helps out too in the garden? She doesn't do the mowing, though, right? Well, we don't have a garden anymore. We had a garden. Say, I when I. <coughs> Where else do you live? We live at this. Eight miles south of town, town at the corner of 800 South and 231. And uh, interestingly, John T. McCutcheon was born there in 1870. That he I was know. born in that house. And there's a plot, oh, there's in the house that you live in? Yeah, he was born in that house. Oh, and there's there's in, a plaque. I've seen it in the newspaper. In, the, in one room, one little, it's one little room, it's, it's called, in his autobiography, it's called the diphtheria room. And that's back, oh, I don't know, sometime in the... World War One, probably, right? I don't know when oh. it was, but a number of people died in that room from diphtheria. So that's called diphtheria. Right? In his autobiography, before he was born, he's talking about his family and his family moving into this less pretentious farmhouse. That's our house, the less pretentious one. <laughs> Wonderful. How did you happen to come across, come across that? Was it a bit, I mean... Well, we were just looking for a place out in the country. I make, I'm not a good financial person. I'm not a financial wizard. Well, this is kind of off the subject a little bit. When we were looking, we were looking at different places, and there was 120 acres just uh, about where the new bridge is over the river, down that area. They, uh, and they wanted $500 an acre. Man, we can't afford that. Well, a year or so later, it sold for fifteen hundred an acre. And it's gone up ever since. The price of property has really gone. Instead, we bought this little ten-acre spot for twenty-five hundred dollars. Wait, you're thinking of the Granville Bridge? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is an interesting bridge, the the new one and the old one. Yeah. Well, that's that's. Have you been in touch with the McCutcheons? Have they ever dropped in? With who? Oh McCutcheon? yes, yes. Mary McCutcheon was there just last year. Right, okay. She was in town for something. And Are you in touch with the family? Do they know that you people live there? Well, n we're not in touch in the okay. sense that we're talking all the time. Sure. But when they come by, they come out and they look and we let them do whatever they want. That's great. That's wonderful. I did, oh, that's great. And you got that plaque that's out there, you know? Yeah, I mean, did you, when you bought the house, did you know that that's where he was born? Yeah, there was a, a little bitty marker. Oh, okay. It's about the size of that envelope. Mm, that's pretty good. Now, the other day I had a problem. I was mowing and my rollover bar hit the corner of that plaque and I shattered the concrete post and I had to strap it together. One of these days I'll have to put a new post in. Oh, well, okay, yeah. Didn't hurt the sign. That's all right. But that's I got to okay. put a new post in. <laughs> Do you have a uh, Purdue tradition? That you'd like to share with us? What comes to mind? I nothing. Yeah. How about an outstanding mind. event? Doesn't have to necessarily be Purdue. Anything comes to mind? Outstanding event in your life? 
Uh, well, no, not really because uh, everything's been good. Yeah, you've enjoyed most of it's been. Yeah. Actually, it, I I stayed on until I was sixty-seven, and uh, did you take the the early the halftime retirement or not? Well, I think at sixty-five I went halftime, and then okay. uh, a couple of years later I decided to retire. Okay. <laughs> I think the. Uh, Gerald Bottoms forced me to retire because he retired that year and uh, the department head said that I had to teach his area and my area and I said no I'm just going to retire <laughs> so <laughs> my time <laughs> it's my time <laughs> and well, since I'm retired I, I haven't missed it sure well I, I miss the students especially the, the well, I, I shouldn't say the good students I taught, I wanted them to learn, I wanted them to understand it, not memorize it. And so they can, the thought process. The thought think. process. And the ones that bought into that, I got along with real good. The ones that didn't, they just wanted to know what do we need to know and don't bother us with anything else. Sure. They just didn't have much to do with me. Yeah. So I didn't know. Perfect. Any closing comments? Anything that you, that you look back and look ahead that you'd like to say? Oh, not really. It's just uh, been an interesting adventure. And you decide to stay on in Lafayette after you retire? Well, our youngest son, which I mentioned, he has six kids, and they live in Stockwell, if you know where Stockwell is. So they're 10 miles from our house, and all of our friends are in this area, and we see no reason to move. I like where we live. We fixed up an old house. It was built about 1865, mm -hmm. and it's it's not a mansion or anything, but it's comfortable and and it's I, special. I like the outdoors. I, like I don't that. I don't like hunting. I don't like fishing. I just like to be out, and I had and I like to be in also. I don't like to go camping because I like my bed. So I've got all that right there, and there's no reason to go anywhere. <laughs> Stick with what you've got and enjoy. That's the bottom line. That's good. We, we do take a trip once every two or three years. In fact, October 27th, we're headed for Modesto, California, and we're going to take Amtrak. That's nice. I like trains. I was grown, grew up with trains. We used to take a train to Detroit when our father was there. That's good. Well, Professor Russell, I want to thank you very much for this interview. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>